Hi, I'm Pastor Tay of the Titus 2 Ministry and PastorTay.com. Welcome to Expresso. It's an interactive Bible study that is like Expresso, strong and smooth. Enjoy the taste. Hi, folks. This is Don Owsley, Dr. Don, as some of you know me. I am recording on my own Facebook page, and uh, it will be uh, linked also to Titus 2 Communities. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, marriage support group, as well as the explicitly Christian marriage group on Facebook. Both of those groups have a significant number of people who are following and engaged, and what they desire is as Christians to enhance and help their marital relationships. So this evening, what we're going to do uh, is talk about uh, what you can do to re-engage those deep conversations. I want to greet those of you who are tuning in on YouTube, the Espresso channel, or looking on the Units tab later on, which you can do. And uh, George Zoe, who's uh, with me this evening, he is uh, one of the, well, he is the administrator. I'm glad he's here. And Dr. Tay Shin is the one who put this all together, together many, many years ago, and we're grateful for that. I have been a pastor. I am retired now, and I am a pastoral counselor biblical counselor, as well as um, a uh, life coach. And I've done that for well over 20 years. And so I'm lending my um, expertise, if you will, uh, to this group. But my primary focus is building and developing families, especially helping parents with their children and uh, young parents, particularly as they um, work with their children and raise their children and so if you want to find out what that's all about, you can go to my webpage, relevate.org. Uh, we have a normally a four-session rotation. We've added a fifth, but the four main sessions are communication, conflict, in-laws, and sex. And we've talked about a couple of other things, such as finances and Christian marriage. So if you would like to join or tune in, that would be awesome. We'd love to have you. Well, I'm just going to dive right in because the time is limited and I have a, oh, a lot to say about this subject. And again, the focus of this evening is what can you do when you don't have deep talks with your spouse any longer? What can you do when you don't seem to have much to talk about? But what can you do when you find it hard to communicate deeply? And that goes beyond the surface of the normal day-to-day -day life and, and uh, e events. So let me paint for you a scenario here. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions, make sure you type that in. I'll, I hope to uh, be able to catch it. Um, uh, George will try to get my attention and uh, post that question. Uh, you can always go later on for the full notes if you miss anything on Relevate.org. Uh, they'll be posted there in a couple of days, and the um, we'll, we'll find this uh, recorded in, in uh, in other places as well. All right, so this is the scenario. Here we go. When a couple first meets, and I'm talking about a normal couple, not a couple who, who have uh, mental illnesses or challenges or, uh, or anything like that, main, main, major deficits. I'm talking about your typical couple. And this could be in any culture. When they first meet, their hearts are Twitterpated, as, um, as we've heard in Bambi. You know, that very romantic movie, right? They find lots of things to talk about, lots of things to communicate uh, in conversations. And the conversation can, can be very shallow or they can be very deep. Uh, they can be lighthearted or they can be serious. And so you have this ebb and flow and, and back and forth exchange with one another you know, when you first meet. And uh, after a couple has been together for a while, the conversations no longer seem like that or appear to be as intense uh, or varied. And that's normal. I just want to put you at rest that that's pretty typical. Some couples are fine about talking um, on the surface level, on basic things like the weather, how things go today, uh, food, dinner, uh, you know, what's in the mail, things like that. And m most couples are, are okay with that. They don't want to go any deeper. They don't have to. Maybe they do once in a while, but they're just satisfied with the relationship they have and very comfortable with that. And there's nothing wrong with that. And maybe some of you are like that. 
Uh, however, others enjoy deeper conversations about life. They want to get into it. Uh, they want to uh, re-engage and uh, express the kind of relationship and conversation that they had when they first met. Couples who are opposites often or typically find varied and different interests. So it can be a challenge and they have to work hard at coming up with uh, things that they can find in common to be able to dialogue and banter back and forth and either stay shallow or go deep, whatever their preference is. Well, the dynamics of most couples are like this. Before marriage, when they first meet, being new to one another opens up opportunities of discovery. Uh, you're on an exploration. You want to find out more about this person. You know, what's he like? Where is he from? What kind of family does he have? Um, you know, what are his favorite sports? What kind of food does he enjoy? And, you know, how did he do in school? Is he educated or not educated? All these questions, you know, becomes an exploratory engagement on both uh, parts of the couple. Usually, you know, if you don't have an interest or didn't have an interest early on, then uh, perhaps you should have. But most couples do that. And there's deep curiosity about the other person. They want to know who that other person is. Uh, not only because they're thinking about the possibility of getting married somewhere down the line, or it could be the fact that they just want to know somebody who is new to them, at least new on that relational level. So you act differently. And uh, when, for example, when my wife and I first married, she, I was stationed in the army over in Okinawa, Japan, and she came over for a visit uh, with her parents she was in the, at the university getting her degree. And when she came over to visit her parents who were in the Air Force, who were friends of mine, um, we hit it off pretty quickly. And so uh, we, within a few weeks, hit it off so much that everybody, except for us, everybody was not surprised when we announced that we believed we were going to get married and announced our engagement. It happened rather quick, though we didn't get married for another 18 months or so. But why they saw this or what they saw, what they noticed, and sometimes couples do notice this is, you know, you look into your eyes deeply. You, you look into each other's eyes with care and concern. And, and, and it, it, rather than looking away, you, you have this uh, connection, right? Have you experienced that? Um, you're genuinely kind to each other. You, you, you show gratitude. You find what he or she likes and uh, doesn't like. You know, you, you end up deliberately serving, whether it's opening the door for each other or, you know, giving flowers or bringing a box of chocolates or, uh, you know, buying, buying something new, you know, for one another. And then you uh, become physically close and not in the sense I'm not talking about sex, sex here. What I'm talking about is you become close within proximity. You, you find that, you know, you might have um, sat down on the couch and the more you got to know each other, the more, you know, the closer you got to one another on the couch. Um, this is very typical. And they find that when people are within closer proximity to, to one another, uh, the relationship is enhanced. And um, so, let me, let me explain that what happens when you're Twitter-pated is a biologically, because there's a reason for this as we'll look at it in a moment. Physiologically, there's this thing called the oxytocin hormone. I'm not a doctor, medical doctor, but I've read enough to understand the oxytocin hormone. This is called the love hormone or the connection hormone. It's what bonds moms with their babies and later on their fathers and so forth and bonds people together. Oxytocin is what gives you the butterflies in the stomach and, uh, you know, the willies and, and uh, that Twitter patient and the heart and the excitement and uh, the interest, uh, you know, the, the flushed feeling. Um, well, all that was manifest when my wife and I first met and, and everyone picked up on that um, rather readily. I mean, it wasn't something we had to tell anyone. And that's pretty typical with couples who have found this romantic love with one another. Uh, it's the feeling of romance. That's what oxytocin is. And uh, in fact, one author said that love, that kind of love, romantic love, is the momentary upwelling of three 
tightly interwoven events. First, a sharing of one or more positive emotions between you and the other. Second, a synchronous, uh, a synchrony between you and the other person's biochemistry and behaviors. And thirdly, a reflected motive to invest in each other's well-being. So, you know, that's, that's a um, good psychological explanation of what goes on. Bottom line is you have this romantic love feeling. And it's a love hormone that literally draws you to another person and motivates you to show care and concern and service for each other. Now, God has put that within us, and that's normal. And those romantic feelings usually stay until you get married um, and sometime after or when you finally make the commitment and sometime after. But after a while, um, it, uh, things begin to change. There's a natural desire when you are Twitterpated or a natural desire when you have this love hormone uh, to seek each other out, to serve each other, to please each other, make each other happy. Uh, there's a greater capacity to put up with each other's idiosyncrasies. In fact, as they often say, love is blind. Uh, that's true, literally. There is something about the brain when this goes on that you tend not to see the faults or deficits or problems in the other person. And uh, there's there are many reasons for that, but we won't get into it. Just that's how it is. That's the way it is. Uh, there's good eye contact which has proven to be a key way to be in sync with another person, to see each other's souls, you know, as they say, so to speak. And uh, you really get each other. You understand one another, and, and you like one another, um, and you really connect. Well, what happens? Uh, this um, oxytocin is, um, is something that often happens, and then you get married, and after a while it dissipates, uh, then after marriage, the body produces not only oxytocin, but that begins to wane and other hormones begin to fill in. So there are hormones that men have that supplement or help and encourage and partner with their uh, testosterone. And for the women, for a woman, uh, there are hormones that uh, foster and, and come alongside estrogen and some of the other hormones. And basically what those hormones do is help um, in a natural sense, in a physiological sense, to bring those people who've come together because of this love hormone, uh, to bond together then and connect. So the oxytocin levels go down. And notice in relationships, oxytocin you know, can go like this in life. They can spike sometimes, they can be flat sometimes, you know, it's not a steady thing. And you cannot maintain that level of oxytocin for any length of time. But those other hormones kick in, which motivates us physiologically in our brains and in, in our minds uh, to desire true connection. And so where the one drops off, the others pick up and you have that connection. Um, it, it encourages couples to connect on a regular, normal, day-in, day-out uh, relationship. But um, So when passionate love fades, that's when compassionate love uh, kicks in or steps up. As they say, when the sizzle begins to fizzle, uh, what you want to do is you develop compassion for one another for a connection. Well, after you're married, that love romantic feeling subsides a bit and these other uh, hormones kick in, as I say. And one book you might want to wreck or two books you might want to check out are uh, by Luann, I'm not sure how to say it, Brizendine, Brizendine, The Female Brain and the Male Brain. Excellent information, very insightful. Uh, to my knowledge, not Christian, but that's okay. Good stuff physiologically. So these hormones keep you together. Now, we know biblically, and I'm sure you know biblically, that a marriage, according to uh, what God says, is a covenant relationship. It's a bond uh, that uh, you come together. It's more than just merely a contractual thing that happens. It's a bond in, in which, as we see in Genesis, and we see in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, you know, the, the husband leaves and uh, comes with his wife, 
they weave together, they cleave together, and they are then together as a married couple. God calls us to make these vows and commits us. But interestingly enough, he gives us the desire and the drive and these hormones, uh, the physical drive to be able to remain connected. Romantic oxytocin feelings are fleeting. And oftentimes, and, and I'm sure Pastor uh, Tay can verify this in his counseling sessions, but oftentimes um, what happens is, is people want to, uh, they assume that because those feelings of romance are no longer there, then love is gone. And that's not the case. Because rather than it being passionate, uh, it becomes compassionate. And so you go from one to the other and you maintain, you know, stability and a, a good modicum of, uh, you know, the levelness in your relationship and with all the hormones and so forth. And you do that for a long time. But couples, oftentimes women will say, I don't feel romantically involved with my husband anymore. Or, you know, I've heard that from a man. I don't feel like I love her anymore. What they often mean is I don't have that feeling, Twitter patient, that uh, oxytocin any longer. And that's how it is. And that's normal. Um, but there are ways to recapture that in, in your marriage. And, and you can contact Pastor Tay uh, later on about how to do that. Well, that's the backdrop. Okay, you with me? Any questions or thoughts? Anyone? I'm looking here to see if George has posted any. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, you can put your comments. And by the way, I'll try to review the comments uh, afterwards and, and answer as best as I can. Let's spend the last 15 minutes here talking about the three main problems and what to do then to get into a deeper conversation with one another because these conversations about what we're talking are built on the relationship that we have with one another. And um, there are problems oftentimes when, when uh, people say, well, I just, I don't talk like I used to. We don't get along like we used to. We don't have the conversations we did when we first met. Well, the fact is that's normal. And that's kind of a reality. Um, so what can you do about it? Well, here are the problems. One problem that you might have is your expectations, your expectations, the expectation to feel romantically in love all the time or most of the time. And so I would encourage you to say you can feel romantically in love. You can feel that, but it can't be all the time. It's physiologically impossible, uh, even if they, you know, shot you up with uh, um, a lot of the hormones that are necessary for that. Now, one, right, one reason is uh, uh, for that is, as I said, is because now you're in the connection mode. And whether it's been a year or whether it's been 40 years, by the way, my wife and I have been married uh, 41 years, going on, uh, yeah, 41 years, maybe 42, maybe it's 14, I don't remember, anyway. Um, so you have expectations to be romantically in love all or most of the time. The other expectation is, the way that we related when we first met at the beginning is how we should always relate. And that too is somewhat unrealistic. And the reason is, is because hopefully you have grown and your spouse has grown. You've um, built the kind of relationship where you kind of anticipate and know what you're going to say to each other or with each other about things. And you've discussed, you know, the, uh, your, your pet dog that you've had and, and there really isn't much to talk about it, the pet dog, um, on a, except on a surface level, if you get what I mean. Um, so how you related and converse at the beginning is not how you should always do so. It's different uh, for the reasons stated. Um, thirdly, you know, there's the expectation my husband or wife are like me. They're going to like what I like. They're going to have the same interests that I have. Uh, the same desires, the same goals, and so forth. Well, my wife and I have found over the years that we have to work pretty hard to maintain, um, to stay on the same path, if you will, because for one, we have, we are polar opposites almost on anything. 
And we have worked hard to maintain that relationship of togetherness over the years. And like all couples, it's been stretched and all couples, it's been strengthened. Uh, but what we have found is um, m my wife, for example, is a consummate musician. She's a violinist. She's been playing the violin since fourth grade. She teaches music. She's in orchestras and symphonies and, and uh, special events, especially this time of year. You know, that's her love. She, she does that. She loves classical music. You know, but me, I don't appreciate it the way she does. Um, oftentimes, I just don't get it. You know, she likes the very, very difficult, challenging music to play, and uh, that kind of hurts my brain. You know, I get brain cramps when I listen to it. I like Mozart, and, you know, I like other um, Beethoven and some of the other uh, um, famous musicians, but she really gets into music, and I don't. Um, and that was hard at first because what she wanted is for me to get into music as much as she did. I, on the other hand, for many years, I was really into theology and philosophy. Now, we both enjoy and like history. So we have that one thing common. Uh, but, you know, I'll give her a brain cramp if I start talking about theology. Uh, you know, some of the heady stuff that I learned in seminary. Um, and uh, she'll give me a brain cramp. Uh, if she begins explaining to me all the nuances and the differences and the technical ideas and, and um, you know, everything that is behind music. So we have to accept where each other are, right? Uh, you know, he has his interests, that's okay. She has her, her interests, that's okay. The question is, how do you find common interests? And what do you do about those uh, seemingly exclusive, mutually exclusive interests. Well, there are the expectations. And uh, there's also the expectation we have, we have to have deep conversations all the time. I love deep conversations. I love deep conversations when we're trying to solve the world's problems, uh, getting together with friends and, uh, you know, we, we address, uh, very, very important issues, and, and we get pretty heavy about it. I love doing that. Um, and sometimes my wife and I love doing that together as well. But uh, marriage ends up becoming like a dance, you know. It's a, a fast dance, slow dance, good dance, bad dance, and so forth. And that's just how life is. And I think the problem, one main problem, one main problem is the expectations that we have for the marriage. Uh, they need to be realistic and they need to be biblical and the expectations we have for one another. The other problem is our own sinful habits, our own sinful habits. Um, like, for example, you might be too selfish or proud. Uh, the only things that interest you are worth listening to. If you've been around people like that, you know, the only time they'll listen is if it's something of interest to them. Uh, conversations are only about you and your stuff. As soon as it turns away to her stuff or to his stuff and his interest, then, you know, you turn it off and you close it out. You disrespect your spouse. Um, you know, this is a common thing that I've counseled where wives disrespect their husbands, or at least they feel that the husbands feel that way. And, but then conversely, husbands uh, don't love their wives as they ought, and wives don't feel as loved, even though both need love and respect together. You don't genuinely love your spouse. Um, you know, that's a, that's a major problem when you don't do that and you haven't worked at it and developed it and nurtured that, then typically what happens, you can shut down the conversation and, and the relationship. And fifthly, you, some people are very condescending. You know, they know more than you. you know, so I, I've known husbands who do this. The wife will will be informed about a particular subject and she'll begin to pipe up and the husband will say, you don't know anything about that. When in reality, she might know a lot more than he does, but he, you know, his proud, his pride is too proud to allow that and it gets in the way. And the other, the third problem, and there are many problems that close off this kind of relationship is uh, your communication style. We've covered this in the other communication uh, segments in the past. You could go to the units tab and review those uh, 
and you can learn about listening and communicating and talking and and resolving conflicts and in communication and so forth. And so I'm not gonna touch that. Let me see if I can wrap up with uh, seven things you can do. What can you do to bring this back? What can you do to deepen those conversations and um, capture again, the relationship that you had at the beginning uh, of your marriage? Well, first of all, make a commitment to personally change. The fact of the matter is, you can't change your spouse. You can't change his heart, her mind, you know, habits or anything like that. All you can do is work on your own life and change. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it will make your spouse change, but it will certainly enhance the relationship usually um, in a normal healthy relationship. Um, but it will encourage your spouse to also to seek change. So make a commitment to personally change, to enjoy healthy, nurturing, deep conversations. Both of you need to work at changing your own lives in your own hearts. And um, usually it's often, you know, the one spouse or the other who has a problem uh, getting into deep conversations. If it's a sin issue, then repent. You know, that means do a turnabout, change, stop what you're doing, quit it, you know, uh, quit it and kill it, and put it away and um, turn in faith to Christ and change it. As Paul says, put off the old and put on the new, you know, put on, put off the old way of talking and conversing and the language that you have and put on a new language and new conversations. If it's something else, then discover what it is. Um, maybe you feel intimidated talking about particular things. You know, what you have to do together as a couple is sit down and investigate what is the problem. Discover what, you know, what's holding you back, what's, uh, what that barrier is for you in the relationship. Have a conversation, what you believe is hindering these conversations. Start with you first and then, and then say honestly, you know, I think you're just not a good listener. And don't get riled. That even if it's true, or if it's not true, don't get riled. Just listen and say, okay, you know, I'll accept what you're saying. Why do you say that? We've covered that uh, in the past. You, all, you definitely want to speak truthfully and listen intently and purposefully. Uh, you want to receive and validate what your spouse is feeling, even if you think that he or she is wrong, uh, because that is his or her perspective. You want to do that to start the conversation in order to explore and develop it. This, so you make a commitment to change. The second thing is recognize that um, compassionate and companion type love is based on friendship, affection, comfort, and shared interests. So what you really need to do is explore how to, um, you know, to bubble that up again, you know, to deepen the friendship level. Uh, to deepen the affection and comfort in those shared interests. Compassionate love is a commitment, and compassionate love leads to a passionate love, to romantic love. So, thirdly, is develop the heart and skill of listening well. Once again, please go to the units tab for the couple of segments that we've talked about um, how to listen and listen well, listen effectively. Fourth, fourth thing here, is foster a relationship that will feed romance. You can have the romantic feeling back. Uh, you can get oxytocin levels up again, and they're gonna be fleeting and they're going to come and go, but that's okay, that's how life is. So how to do that? You determine to get to know your spouse again. Determine to get to know your spouse again. It's rare that couples really ever know each other deeply enough or perfectly enough or fully enough. Um, become an investigator, you know, be curious again. You know, that's what often starts a relationship. You're curious about your future spouse, you know, the one you're dating, you, you wanna know more about him or her. Um, become a private investigator, uh, be a historian, find out the family background, you know, learn more about your, your spouse's grandparents and great-grandparents and home country 
and uh, things like that. You know, how, how many cousins you have and what they're like, if they know what they're like, or, you know, family history, family tree, and all that. Um, discover his or her fears, dreams, hopes, and goals. Many times, as couples, we don't communicate that. We, we think about it. We share it with other people, but we don't do it with one another. So find out, what, is your, what does your husband fear? They'll say, well, I don't fear anything. Yeah, right. Sure he does. You know, fear of failure, the fear of losing his job, a lot of fears. Uh, what are his goals? What are his dreams if he had the ability to do anything he, he could desire in life? What are his dreams? What are your dreams? What are her dreams? Um, and then find common interests and shared experience of, experiences. Find them and foster them more. The other thing is uh, to foster relationship to feed romance is get into closer proximity with one another. Hey, look into each other's eyes. When you talk, don't look away. Look at each other and look deeply at each other. You know, don't get that blank, blank stare and, and um, like you're daydreaming, thinking about something else. Really look at one another uh, because that, that helps um, in the physiologically and mentally. That helps you to engage that other person more deeply. Provide a home environment where each of you feels safe. I'll tell you this, if your spouse does not feel safe with you, uh, you're not going to have a good conversation with her. You're not going to get deep in your conversations. You need to be safe. You have to be safe. Uh, and, and safe, I mean emotionally safe, mentally safe, physically safe, spiritually safe. It's very, very important. Do new and exciting things. Try something new. Uh, you know, do new, even silly things. That's proven uh, that those who have healthy, good, mature, lasting relationships, that's exactly what they do. They do things together, new things together, silly things together uh, that they've never done before. And then focus on sharing healthy, positive things in your lives. Um, I got a question here. Are there any books that you can recommend for couples that have discussion topics? You know, I, I really don't know of any books that speak specifically to this. Uh, I will have this in my notes and blog, and, and uh, perhaps this is something that uh, Pastor Tay can explore later on as well as I can and uh, write more about it. But if I do find a book that talks specifically about these things, I will let you know. Maybe somebody else knows offhand uh, a good book, a good resource. The fifth thing here, that was the fourth thing, foster relationship to feed romance. Fifth is agree to discuss deeper matters. Just make an agreement. You're going to talk about it. Write out the list that you want to discuss. If it's about non-personal things, agree on what those things are. You know, if the husband wants to talk theology or philosophy uh, or, you know, the specifics about fishing, give him time to do that. But husband, give your wife that time and the opportunity to discuss you know, philosophy or fine recipes or, or traveling or knitting or whatever it might be. And give each other time and let each other talk. And, and even if, you, you know, it's hard for you to get to engage with them about it, ask the questions as necessary. And if it's a personal issue, then make an appointment and keep the appointment with each other to talk about it. Sixthly, agree on a good place or time. Date nights are good. Um, after dinner events, days off and Saturdays, but because we're in a world where we're so rushed and busy, often we neglect it and other things come up and uh, take over when what we need to do is make an appointment like and keep it just like we would have to keep an appointment with a doctor or a specialist. Okay. And finally, the last thing is make accommodations for your spouse to have intellectually stimulating conversations with others. Make accommodations for you and your spouse to have intellectually stimulating conversations with others. Um, I find, my wife and I have found over the years that when we get together with friends who love to really get deep in you know, solving the world's problems, right? And when we do that, um, you know, sometimes we're, we're joking around and other times it gets pretty heavy and heady and, and serious then uh, then uh, 
I'll say something and my wife will turn to me and say, oh, what? I never knew that. You know, here we've been married 25 years. And I said, you didn't know that? You know, things like that often come up. However, if, if, you, are, if you have the, the brain and the mindset and the mentality that you really enjoy deep thinking and you know, good philosophy or heady books, or whatever it might be, and your spouse doesn't want to, that's all right. Get together with another couple or other people who do and then allow, allow each other to talk. Now, husbands or wives, that also means conversely, you know, give your spouse the opportunity to explore and engage um, those deeper conversations, so to speak, with other couples and other people within group settings. Don't hold it against your husband or wife if she's not on the same intellectual level as you. Um, you know, perhaps uh, you didn't realize that he wasn't, you know, he doesn't have as high IQ as you do. Um, I know a lot of husbands who married women who are much more intelligent than, than they, and they're very intimidated by it, but they were able to work it out. And get together with trusted friends. And if your husband or wife isn't to talking, isn't into talking philosophy or theology or trigonometry or you know, music or whatever, then get together with those friends who do like to talk about those things. All right, I have gone over six minutes again. Oh, dear. Um, any comments? Any questions? You want to wrap this up? Any thoughts? I noticed uh, real quickly on my monitor that a couple of people had made some suggestions. I'll go back. I, I didn't see them uh, fast enough. But any questions? Yeah, these are these are good. Uh, this is a good question. Is there a book for discussion topics to get deep conversations started? Um, excellent. Well, I appreciate being with you again. Uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, those of you who are with Titus 2 community were here and explicitly Christian Merit Group that you also joined us as well as my friends on my own Facebook page. Uh, you can look again and in the units tab later on when it's posted there or later much later you can uh, uh, go to the link in the espresso channel on youtube and that will be posted and you can go there and um, revisit uh, this this series uh, or any other of the specific things um, i would appreciate if you check out my uh, website as well www.relabate.org and if you have any questions, uh, parenting questions, or uh, or how to work a enhancing your own family relationships, please let me know. I think that's it. Uh, that's a wrap, and I'm going to close it out. Stay tuned next time as we explore another excellent topic. Thanks for joining us for a devotional drink today. If you love espresso, click here to subscribe so you know when the next one is ready to enjoy. Visit our website for resources for every chapter of your life. And if you're thirsty for more, click here. See you next time. May God bless your day.